Good morning, uh, everyone. Can you see me, hear me? Uh, there's something wrong with this uh, stream deck box here, but uh, was already wrong time, some time ago. Hopefully it's fixed. So, um, well, I mean, it's not fixed here, but if you can see me then, that's the important thing. So we're going to uh, look at the uh, perihelion precession today. Um, I don't know if I already written this title or not. I think we, I, ha I might have, uh, maybe not. So I haven't, then we need a number, Eva. Uh, the last one was shadow of a black hole with okay. 4.16, 4. so 4.17. That would be 4.17 then. Okay, good. So we want to look at the uh, precession of the perihelion of, uh, well, in general, but uh, this was the first experimental test of general relativity, that uh, general relativity is giving the correct number for uh, the following, well, we have the sun here and we have uh, Mercury uh, around it. And uh, first approximation, Mercury is following uh, an elliptical Kepler orbit. But then there are all, uh, there's Venus here, there's Earth, there's uh, all the other guys uh, in the planetary system, which do influence um, the orbit here, right? So people uh, to calculated so uh, the influence of of um, of other planets on the orbit of Mercury, and this was already known uh, at the end of the 19th century. And there are corrections, and there are important. There are important enough to be observable, but they were not giving the right number, right? So if you just take Newton theory, the influence of the other planets on the orbits of, uh, um, uh, of Mercury, uh, the orbit actually processes, uh, but it just gives the wrong number. Well, so one theory was maybe this has to do with quadruple moments of the sun or something like that, but uh, this, just the numbers were just not there. Uh, another theory was that there is an extra planet which we don't see uh, and which could explain the effect and uh, I don't remember now who proposed this but there was such a proposal uh, put forward but uh, the problem was nobody saw this planet right so Einstein came with his theory and uh, he said well we have perihelion precession so what's the perihelion perihelion is the point on the orbit which is closest to the uh, to the to the sun, right? So, uh, if this was a generic star, this would be the periastron, the point of the orbit closest to the star, uh, which is uh, uh, relevant. While well, in our case, it's uh, the perihelion. There's a name for the other one which I never remember. Anyone remembers what's the uh, name of the point of largest distance from the so in german it's afil i think something like affilion or something like that maybe yeah something like that yeah okay right and so uh, uh let's see so that would be uh so for uh, affilion affilion would be for for the star and uh for uh for for the sun and for a general star that would be um well, if somebody can look it up on Wikipedia and tell me, then I'd be, uh, I'd be grateful. In any case, well, uh, let's calculate this, right? So, so the point is that the orbit processes, what does it mean? That, uh, well, if the, uh, you go once around uh, the orbit in Newton theory, you'll get, and if you disregard other planets, you'll get back to where you started. And, uh, uh, on the other hand, in Einstein theory, you're going to get a slightly, this closest point will be slightly moved. So you can think of this as this orbit being very close to a Keplerian one, right? So it's not the Keplerian one, but it's the formed one. 
but so this Keplerian one would be rotating so that when uh, instead of ending here, we'll just get uh, uh, somewhere here. And when we go the next time around, we'll get there. And so <laughs> it's supposed to be ellipses. Uh, obviously not, but uh, okay. So, but the, the, the idea is right that you get a, a, a sequence of. Uh, Yeah, ter terrible drawing, terrible. <laughs> Good. And so the question is, can we calculate this, right? So can we calculate this? And of course, the answer is yes. So that's what we're going to do. And for this, we need some equations. We try, uh, let's see if I can remember them. Uh, so in Newton theories that we had, um uh, say u zero uh d2 u zero over d phi square is equal minus what did you get uh something like minus u zero plus uh epsilon this epsilon was m square j newton square uh d square m zero square something like that I will cross check right away, but I think that's the right formula and uh, which we identify with, uh, uh, well, M zero is one, right? So M is the mass of the central object. So this is M. M zero is the mass of the moving object. Uh, and uh, we just set it to one, who cares? And so the important, uh, well, actually we say that uh, J is uh, JN over M zero, right? So that would be the, and G is one. So that would be the formula and J is uh, not equal zero for this equation. So let me just put a number one here. And uh, in Schwarzschild, uh, we will have uh, D two U, uh, I'm going to run out of of room over d phi square. Well, we had the same stuff as here, minus u. Uh, plus u square, plus epsilon. Maybe there's a two somewhere. Something like that. Maybe you can cross check. I'm going to cross check too. There's three here. Okay. okay. And uh, we had the Newtonian solution. So that uh, let's be this two, and then the Newtonian solution was three. U naught was uh, this uh, epsilon here, uh, one plus uh, the eccentric. Ec oh gosh, eccentricity, the eccentricity of the orbit uh, times cos phi. And um, wrong phi. Okay. So this was uh, uh, what we derived so far. And of course, these equations are pretty similar, except for, uh, for this term here, right? And this term is quadratic. And uh, U, or this epsilon, is order uh, 10 to minus 9 
uh, for Earth on its orbit or for Mercury uh, again also this order. So this is obviously small already. Uh, and uh, and then three u square is obviously even smaller. So the idea is let's try uh, to solve two by perturbation. Try to solve two by a perturbation calculation. So we write u is well the Newtonian solution which we already have here uh, and uh, which is order epsilon and uh, correction term which is going to be order of epsilon square because this source term is order of epsilon square so the correction should be of the same order so put this into an equation into two into into two right this is equation two which one is three this this one this is two this is one so we put this into two, what's going to happen? Uh, well, uh, just to make sure that we have the orders uh, right, we're going to write u naught is epsilon u naught and v is epsilon square v. And we're going to put this into the equation here. So uh, epsilon d2 u naught over d phi square plus epsilon square d to v over d phi square is equal minus epsilon u minus epsilon square v. And now if I square u, I'm going to get uh, three epsilon square u naught square. And everybody else will be order, will be higher order, right? So, uh, well, there'll be this plus epsilon, which I should not forget here. Right, so, so, so this term is actually u zero plus epsilon v square which is u0 square plus there's an extra epsilon here and uh, if i include this epsilon square here then obviously the dominant term is this one that I've kept here. And this is going to go in the error term. And this is going to go in the error term. So this is the equation I'm going to get. And now we take, uh, remember that we took u naught to be the solution of the Newtonian equation. So this term cancels this term and cancels this term. Right, so d2 u naught, well, this was lowercase u naught, but uh, that's the same up to this epsilon. Uh, this is this one, and the epsilon is here. So this one is uh, gone. And uh, let's see, I'm going to need. I'm going to need the equation two, so I'm going to copy it here. Uh, D two over D five square 
is equal minus u u square plus epsilon. So this is two. Um, I'm going to need three u naught is equal, and you don't have to copy this because you have it in your notes, but since I'm going to erase things, um, good. So let's start erasing. Well, I obviously going to do, do, need this as well, but So, so now, uh, so we return to this equation here. Uh, so there's an epsilon square here, epsilon square here, epsilon square here. Let's forget the error terms. Uh, you're welcome to add them if you want to, but keep them. But uh, if we ignore them, and that's what I like to do, we're going to get uh, D2 v over d phi square is equal minus uh, v right so epsilon square goes away v plus three u naught square and remember that u naught was just rescaling of this guy by epsilon so this is minus v plus three uh, and I square this, I'm going to get one plus two cos phi plus cos square phi. Good. So now we have this equation. You stare at it. You're thinking, how am I going to solve this? Well, I have a linear equation. Uh, with a homogeneous part which has a frequency uh, one and minus one. So solutions here would be A cos phi plus B sine phi, right? That this uh, one is coming from the frequency square is, is one. And then you have a, a Nonlinear term. So you look up your notes from uh, introduction to analysis, and you say, well, this term is going to produce a constant in the solution. So uh, say uh, alpha. Uh, this term is uh, something called a resonance term. And the way these things works is that 
this thing has the same frequency as the this harmonic oscillator, right? And therefore, it's going to produce terms uh, phi cos phi plus beta phi sine phi and terms like that, but they're already here. And this one, well, this one looks like it's weird. It's a quadratic, but you can decompose it in a, uh, in a frequency two, right? Or something like that. Cos square, you want to decompose this. It's probably something like cos two phi plus one over two, maybe. Must be a formula like that. Right, a positive function twice the frequency because if you if you look at at cos square, it just goes like that, right? So the periodicity twice bigger. So this thing has periodicity, periodicity two, which is not in resonance with this frequency one. So it's going to produce uh, gamma. Well, gamma maybe a uh, c. Uh, cos two phi plus b sine two phi. So this is what v should be out of this. You take this and that's here. You put it in the equation. You determine the constants, and you're done. And it's a messy calculation, which I'm not going to do uh, because. This is a solution, but it's not a natural solution because of these terms, which are called secular terms. And which have nothing to do with the problem at hand. So uh, let me just make it clear. You can just take this, put inside, use the solution you have obtained to calculate the precession of the perihelium. You can do this, right? So this will work, and you're going to get a result out of this. But this is not the right method. And uh, just conceptually. So I would like to present you a better way of doing this, which will give the same result. Uh, I will waste time now doing it, but you will hopefully learn something new by uh, showing you that this is uh, a bit of nonsense, these secular terms. And there is a better way of, uh, of doing this where there are no such things. So, so the, uh, as a spoiler, we're going to do the poincare Linstead method shortly. rather than doing this calculation here. So in other words, I've wasted your time doing a calculation which we're not going to use, but uh, we have plenty of time in life anyway. So compared to eternity, uh, not such a big waste. This is capital V, of course. Uh, good. So why, wh why is this nonsense, right? So now, these terms are periodic, these terms are periodic, this term is periodic, this term is not, right? So, and because of course it's not periodic, that's exactly what you can think of this, that that explains why there is this uh, uh, perihel preces perihelion precession. Um, but the solutions of this problem have to be periodic. Uh, of this equation, which is uh, the right one, uh, of two are periodic. Well, the ones which are interested in, right? So bounded solution, right? So let's see, so bounded solutions, uh, non-singular solutions. And so by non-singular, I mean those that don't go to infinity uh, and those that don't, don't go, uh, don't fall on the center, right? So non-singular solutions. Um, there's nothing wrong going to infinity, but it's, it's singular from the point of view of differential equations. Some things fall out, right? And the reason for this 
is that because there is a, a uh, this uh, there's a conserved energy, right? So there's a conserved energy, conserved energy. And here I mean energy, in the sense that you have this uh, second order equation, which has a constant of motion, and uh, so this constant of motion uh, means that the solution uh, cannot grow up indefinitely, right? For uh, like, like it's here, it has to be periodic. And uh, for this, let's draw the potential uh, which belongs to this uh, equation. Uh, So if we take this equation, uh, this uh, there's a conserved energy. Is, uh, if we think of this as being uh, uh, minus v prime, right? So this is minus v prime of u. Uh, then this is an equation. Uh, two is the same as d over du. Uh, d over d five of one half uh, di over d phi square and uh, the potential which goes with this would be what u square two uh, minus u cubed minus epsilon u something like that uh, is equal zero Right, because if I differentiate this, I'm going to get this time. Yeah, I think that this works. So this is my V of U. And how does this V of U look like? It's a bit, uh, it looks a bit of a hassle uh, because it's a third order thing. But if we take epsilon equals zero, then this is uh, U square e half here. And minus u cube. This is epsilon equal zero. That's uh, the potential we have already seen by when we are looking at the light deflection. Right? So this was exactly this term is the one coming from the fact that we're looking at time like geodesics and not uh, not uh, no ones. Uh, so that was the potential we've seen before. Now our epsilon is small, so for small epsilon. What does this do? It's going to shift this curve a little down, right? So it's going to shift this curve uh, to do something like that, right? So this is V of U. And in this region, uh, all orbits are periodic here. 
right? Because if you take, if I zoom on this region, I'm going to have something which looks like that. And then if I take an energy level, then the orbit just goes here, bounces, this potential goes here, bounces and so forth, right? So in this region, and this region, remember that U is M over R. So large distances corresponds to small u. And we're looking at small u here. So in this region, the orbits will be periodic. We'll do something like that. So the solutions of this problem must be periodic. And this one is obviously not, right? So this is an approximation. It is an approximation which is valid for a little time, but it's not a good approximation for, uh, for this problem. It's not the right way to address these problems. Each time you have secular terms like that, there's a way to regularize them uh, by this Poincaré instead method, which is going to give you an approximate solution, which is periodic. Now, the period of this solution here will not be the same as the one uh, for the Newtonian solution. And, uh, uh, and this will explain the perihelion precession, right? So we're going to have a periodic solution, but the period will be slightly larger than two pi, so that when you're returning to the point of closer approach, you'll do it not after two pi angle, but a slightly larger angle. So this means that this behaves like a rotating object in the, uh, in the plane. So, so this is the ideology behind all this. And let's uh, do this uh, poincare instead method. So I'm going to restart my calculation from scratch. Uh, because there'll be a new idea which has to do with changing uh, rescaling of uh, of time. Well, in this case, time is the angle, but uh, this boils down to a, if this was an equation in time, that would be rescaling of time. So we're introducing, so now this is the poincare instead method. Uh, so we change, we're introducing a new time. So change uh, the angle phi to a new, so the time phi to a new time uh, coordinate. Again, it's angular, but uh, Phi is going to be one plus, there'll be a small correction. So we put an epsilon. Uh, there'll be a number which we want to determine delta and a new, new coordinate phi, right? So the new coordinate phi and delta is to be determined. And how do we determine it? Uh, 
we're going to determine it so that the equation we obtain has no resonances. And right? so to get rid of the resonance term. So the first thing to do is to calculate d over d phi, which is one over one plus epsilon delta d over d nu phi. And because epsilon is small, then this is about the same as one minus epsilon delta d over d phi. Right, so we approximate one over one plus epsilon delta by, by this. Well, I could keep quadratic terms here in the equation uh, if I wanted to, but let me not do this. So second derivative, I just need to square this. And this is an approximate equality. If I square this, this is uh, there'll be a dominant term. Well, there's a one always minus two epsilon delta, uh, and the quadratic term which I ignore. We write as before u is epsilon u naught plus epsilon square d, and put into equation two. Uh, so this is the same calculation as before, almost the same, because now we have an extra factor in front. So we have a factor one minus two epsilon delta d2 u naught over d phi square. Now this is the new angle. Uh, and there is an epsilon yeah, plus epsilon square d2 v over d phi square is equal minus epsilon u naught plus epsilon v. And the quadratic term gives me, as before, three. Can you still see this? Is it okay? No? Okay. It is close to the... Okay, well, let me, I have to erase here anyway, so. Um, so you can try to think yourself what you're going to get here. We're, of course, going to forget every term which is order epsilon cube in this equation, right? So we have terms of order epsilon, epsilon square and the epsilon cube we just don't even want to know that they are there Uh, okay, so I have still have my equation. Uh, so I need three U square terms. So let me just write this one here. Plus three 
um, right, epsilon square u naught square. And forget the cube terms. So terms order epsilon. We get d two u naught over d phi square is equal. And I forgot this epsilon here, of course. Minus u naught plus one. So we take the same solution, the Newtonian solution. U naught is uh, one plus e cos phi. But this is like the Newtonian solution, but not really. It's not really the Newtonian solution because this is a solution which is periodic in this angle, right? It's supposed to satisfy this equation. It's periodic in this angle. But this angle, so it's two pi periodic, but then the original Schwarzschild angle will not be, right? So it is, the difference is a, of the method is here, right? So the zero order solution is periodic in the new angle and not in the old one. That's the mechanism which makes all this work. Good, so now we continue with uh, order of silence square. So to order epsilon, we've already solved the equation, right? So the order epsilon square, uh, epsilon times epsilon, we get minus two delta d to u naught over d phi square, right? Because we have an epsilon here and an epsilon here. Then we have one times this epsilon square plus d2 v over d phi square. This one is order epsilon. Uh, okay, so let's see. So, so one times this is epsilon already done. Two epsilon delta times this epsilon square, it's here. One times this is epsilon square we have here. And this one times this one will be epsilon cube. Forget it. So this one is already epsilon already done. So it's a V here, uh, okay. It's an epsilon square here and uh, minus, nobody protested. So this doesn't count as a, an error, minus V. And uh, plus three U naught square. And plus epsilon, epsilon is already gone, right? Epsilon was already in this equation. So this is our equation here. So uh, what is this thing? I differentiate one, I get zero. I differentiate cos twice, I get cos. I'm very nervous about signs here, but we'll see. Hopefully it will work out. You differentiate twice cos, I get minus cos. So I'm going to get from this minus two delta E cos phi. And this one produces three U naught square, which is three times one plus uh, 2e cos phi. I'm very nervous about science now. Aha, uh -huh. uh, as I should be. 
uh, there's a minus here, right? Okay. So second derivative of u naught give me a minus cos, but there's an extra minus here which gives a, a plus. Plus uh, e square cos square five times. So, and this is a uh, wrong phi. This is the, the new phi. Now remember our worry was this term because it was giving uh, these secular terms in the solution. So terms which were growing with time or with phi in the solution. So choose, we choose, and all the other ones were okay, right? All the other one were giving us something, but it was periodic. Whatever it was, we're happy with it. So we choose a delta so that they cancel out, right? So choose. Two delta E equal equals six E, which is the same as delta is equal three, which is the same as saying that phi is equal one plus three M over J, this was squared times three. Which is the same as saying that the solution is uh, two pi plus three m square over t square times two pi periodic. So this is a correction, right? So the perihelion moves, perihelion is rotated by this angle, right? If you want to come to the nearest, you start at the nearest point, to return to the nearest point, you have to go through a period of this phi, which means that you have to go through a period of, uh, through this period of the Schwarzschild angle, which means that the perihelion is, displaced by, by this angle, right? Very rotated by six pi m square. Well, if you want to put in some g's, uh, that's, <laughs> That's our, this is a G, right? So this is not a six, but a G. So this is the Poincaré instead method at work. And uh, well, maybe if you don't care that much about precession of the perihelion, then maybe you will have learned uh, something new concerning how to solve uh, by approximations. Equations which should have periodic solutions. So this is uh, the first 
prediction of general relativity that Einstein already wrote in his new paper and which was the first stone to the recognition that uh, what he was doing was perhaps interesting. So the last thing we're going to discuss is gyroscopes. So this is going to be the last classical test of general relativity. Uh, one or, or two, two for the price of one. And uh, the general setup is, or the buzzword is a gyroscope precession. So this would be gyroscopes in general relativity, but two uh, or three effects which we're going to get for the price of one. One effect is the special relativity called Thomas precession. Uh, second term, uh, second effect will be a geodesic gyroscope precession. And the third will be the lens steering effect. These three effects are essentially all three coming from one single equation. And uh, this has to do with the question, how do gyroscopes behave in special relativity? How do gyroscopes behave in general relativity. So anyone knows what is Thomas precession? What did make Mr. Thomas famous? Yes? No? So, so this Thomas precession business had to do with uh, quantum mechanics, some kind of spin effects. And if nobody knows, then you're welcome to look it up. Uh, there's a factor two involved, which is weird because you will think about uh, the effect which I'm going to talk to you about. You, it's hard to see that there is a two involved. I mean, there is an effect, but you think that maybe it depends upon a small correction or something like that, but not the factor two. Well, it turns out that uh, there's a factor two involved in this business. So let's try to go to a web page. You don't care about this one. You don't care about this one. Is it this one? No. Good. That's the one. So you have the URL here if you're interested. Um, maybe you can send that one in the chat. And so you can you, just copy. You can you think how, that I know how to do it? <laughs> okay, let me try. Uh, uh, 
uh, how do I do this chat business? Because I, I might have to exit. No, I see. I have to go here. Uh, the, 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 you can find the link in the lecture notes anyway. But um, okay, chat. Good. Found. Got it? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for suggesting this. So what's happening here? You have something which is called a rigid body, which is a weird idea in both in special relativity and general relativity. Uh, but uh, this is called a rigid body, which means that you have this array of little diodes or whatever it is and uh, in the rest frame they are not moving one respect to each other right so you have this uh, array of little dots and now we make a boost and this is rigid in the sense that in our rest frame everybody every part of this array will get the same boost okay so the first stage, stage here is we're taking this thing, we're making a boost. Then we're going to the rest frame of, of the new rest frame, and we're making the same boost to everyone in this new rest frame. Then we do it again and again five times so that we come back to the point we started. Right? So we started with. Um, a boost in the x direction, then a little in the y direction, uh, a little backwards, a little backwards, and we're back where we started. So you see the thing that you see two effects here. Forgot, forget first that the colors change when you're doing this boost, right? So forget this color changing. What you see that after each time, uh, after each boost, the thing looks like it's a little rotated. It is deformed. Even though in the rest frame, you started with something which uh, was completely rigid, and you come back at the end to something which is completely rigid, you see it deformed. Right? But now, when you come back to where you started, the whole thing is actually not in the same position, but it's rotated. So this is uh, called uh, Thomas uh, uh, rotation or Thomas Wigner rotation. And if you go along a loop so that you start with uh, some configuration and go back to this, the net result is that the thing is rotated, right? So now the whole configuration in our rest frame has been rotated compared to the, this one. Good. So this is the rotation effect, right? So now. The question is, why do we view this thing as deformed to start with and not as a rigid object? And what could these colors be? Obviously, if, look, if you look at them, uh, they show you that uh, how, how things, the shape changes, right? At, uh, it looks like, uh, uh, depending upon the color, before you, you applied the color, the shape, uh, right? So here you just uh, have an obvious Lorentz contraction before uh, at the first stage. And then if you look at the colors, then the things which are, have color become deformed more than the ones which don't change color. So what could this be? Suggestions. Right, this is just a boost means Lorentz contraction, right? So let's see. So we have this array, and we've made every point has been given the same boost in this direction. So we, this, we see this thing Lorentz contracted. Now in the newest frame, everybody gets the same boost. 
but it gets the same boost at the same time in the new Lorentz frame. But the same time in the new Lorentz frame at various points is not at the same time for us at these various points. Therefore, when you are applying the boost simultaneously to all points in the rest frame uh, for, our, for us, some points get the boost, some others don't, right? So that's this wave propagating because the blue, light blue things now are the ones which have obtained a boost. The other ones, we still don't see this because our simultaneity is not the same as the other ones here, right? <coughs> Apologies. So this is the Thomas precession. Nothing to do with general relativity, special relativity, right? That's purely special relativity effect. Then you start doing moves, boosts and you're doing boosts along various axes. It's not the same as doing a boost and along one axis, but it's a, a boost is accompanied by a rotation. Okay, and that's the that's what's happening here. So this is the uh, Thomas uh, precession. Uh, now I told you we're going to talk about gyroscopes. So let's see. Um, Let's see about these gyroscopes then. The gyroscopes are rather complicated objects. And I'm going to show you some videos because uh, I just love them. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with the calculations we're going to do because we're going to uh, do uh, gyroscopes uh, without, uh, without forces acting on them. But just to keep in mind what, what, what you're fighting against and what's happening, right? So this is a gyroscope. Uh, on this gyroscope, there is a force acting, which is the gravitational field. And so uh, this, uh -huh. why did it uh, close? I don't like this. Okay. Restart this again. Hopefully, it's not going to bomb out now. Good. So, then that's another version here of what can happen in this example. I mean, I, I can watch these videos for hours, so. <laughs> I just think just stay there, right? So this is a, an obviously a non-stable. Uh -huh. And this, uh, the video bombs, unfortunately. Uh, but I am a stubborn person, so we'll just uh, try again. Maybe if I share my whole screen, it's going to work better. Let's see what happens. So 
this is gyroscope in a gravitational field, right? So it does tend to do weird things. Now, if it were in free fall, uh, then uh, the situation would probably be different. Here, it's not in free fall, right? It's supported by something. So there is a, uh, a force uh, exerted on this object and, um, and um, And it does what it wants to do, right? And describing this is a bit uh, daunting. I love this one. I, I love them all. <laughs> now there are equations for this, right? So these are uh, the equations of a gyroscope in classical mechanics. Uh, one can write them down and they're very difficult to solve. Um, uh, it leads to all kind of uh, things like uh, chaotic behavior. This one is an example of precession, right? So this thing just processes along its axis. Let me show this again. That's the simplest motion possible, right? You have just a precession along. So you have an axis and the whole thing rotates along this axis, it's called precession. And when it's doing this with wobbling, it's called mutation and stuff like that. Good, so this is, uh, uh, that's it for the videos. And now I'd like to go back to um, the main, um, Lecture, so the best thing is probably just to switch this off. So Eva will tell me what number we're doing now. Uh, should be 4.18. 4.18, so this is gyroscopes. And there are three things. Yes, and uh, because we uh, don't have much time left, uh, I'm going to do all three of them in one go. Uh, we're not going to do separate sessions. We're not going to do details, but at least I'm going to uh, explain you uh, roughly what's happening. And uh, so uh, Thomas, uh, the second would be geodesic precession. And the third guy would be a lens steering effect. By the way, the steering here is uh, our steering. I like to say that this is uh, a colleague of mine of this university, but of course a colleague at the same university, but uh, a few years back. Uh, that's steering father, right? So that's not uh, Walter Turing, who, who died uh, a few years ago. Uh, who was uh, uh, also a well-known, world-renowned uh, physicist uh, uh, with contributions mainly to quantum mechanics and uh, field theory models, but that's his father, who was both were professors at this university, not quite at the same time. So, uh, so yeah, how do you describe a gyroscope, right? So how to model this? Uh, so a gyroscope, we can think the simplest model is just, we say the direction uh, of the axis, right? Direction and the uh, speed of rotation. So how do we uh, describe a direction? Well, by a space-like vector, right? So a space vector space vector, uh, and the space vector actually has both information about the direction, that's the direction of the vector, and the speed of rotation, the length, right? So the long, faster it spins, the, the longer we're going to take it, right? So in other words, we're going to uh, model this by a four vector, 
s and this four vector is orthogonal to the four velocity of uh, its rest train right so four velocity uh, the overall four velocity right so overall four velocity so so of course each part of the gyroscope rotates so each part of this thing has a different four velocity but you think of this object globally as the whole thing has a four velocity and uh, so if we are observing it in the lab like we are doing this in the um, in these videos then this uh, four velocity uh, uh, yeah of, of the um, yeah overall four velocity of the gyroscope Um, uh, so, of course, U. And that would be the same in special relativity and general relativity. Now, uh, what is the right equation in special relativity? If following a geodesic, Well, the answer is uh, rather obvious. If you're following a ge geodesic, then uh, it means that in Minkowski space time, you're just following a straight line. You can always go to a frame so that you're just sitting at the origin. And we have Minkowski space time, nothing acts on this uh, uh, gyroscope. So it just doesn't move. Right? So it's going to be ds over d tau is zero where tau is the proper time, right? Proper time. But it's a bit confusing because we've been usually using S for proper time. And, but since we're using S for this uh, four vector describing the gyroscope, uh, then Then, um, then I'm going to use tau for proper time and not s. So in Minkowski space time, well, the equation would be just nothing changes. Uh, well, I, I've written here the covariant derivative, but the covariant is just partials in, in, in natural coordinates. And this vector should be space like. So in its rest frame, it should be orthogonal to the four velocity. And that's it. So, uh, so, so now we invoke the correspondence principle. Uh, right in in local inertial coordinates. Inertial coordinates. This is the right equation. So this is uh, the simplest uh, model, which is completely trivial in uh, special relativity, but it's not anymore in general relativity, because now we're saying, well, if you're following a geodesic, for example, you're following a, an orbit of a satellite around the Earth, or you're following the orbit of the moon around uh, the Earth, then this is uh, how this uh, gyroscope vector we rotate. So we have the moon, right? So we have the Earth here and the moon rotating around it. Then the moon rotates itself. So it has an axis of rotation. And that's how the axis of the moon, because it's an geodesic, it's freely falling, will change in time. Well, the first question to ask here is, are these equations compat compatible? Is one consistent? So we call this uh, equation A and equation B. 
Uh, what is the issue here? Well, suppose we give the direction of the gyroscope right now. When we can use this equation, solve this equation along this geodesic on which it's moving, and you'll know S for all time. Now, initially, we can suddenly arrange so that this direction of the rotation is orthogonal to our unit time lag vector. Uh, but uh, then S is whatever it is from this equation. Maybe it's not going to be satisfied anymore, right? So, in other words, uh, is B preserved? Is one B preserved under one A? And of course, the answer is yes. I, otherwise, I wouldn't be asking this. So let's see how this works. So we just calculate B over D tau. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't even be writing these equations if they were not. Uh, compatible well that's uh, we use the Leibniz rule so this is uh, the metric itself is uh, does not depend upon well it's, co it's, const it's covariantly constant right so if we uh, th this operator is the same as a covariant derivative if you want to but I mean this is a scalar but we we have two terms like that when we differentiate us. And now this is zero because it's a geodesic. And this is zero by one A. And you, you can probably not see this, but uh, okay. But so I, I hope you hear this, right? So this first term is zero by one a. So we, we get that this whole thing is zero. And therefore, if initially this vector was orthogonal to the full velocity, then it's going to, uh, to be, remain orthogonal. So, so these are the gyroscope equations. And uh, as I said, they're going to give us the geodesic precession and the lens Turing effect. So I'm not going to calculate this. If you maybe, just maybe, it's a little unlikely, but maybe we'll make an exercise in the Übungen about this. Uh, and if the exercise is in the Übungen, then it's easy to solve because everything is in the in the lecture notes so you can just take the lecture notes and see how this calculated there so this uh, this effect a geodesic precession so geodesic a precession. The simplest version would be uh, take a, a circular geodesic in Schwarzschild. And solve A and B. And you will find a uh, precession, the axis. Well, the, so the vector S, right? The vector S precesses. So in other words, here is your sun. Here is your, well, actually you can think about of this is about the earth. So this is actually the Earth. Um, so no, no rays. Okay. And this is a satellite. Uh, actually, the one I have in mind is called the gravity probe A. Uh, B, sorry, B. 
A was had to do. Anyone remembers what was gravity probe A? Obviously not. So gravity probe A had to do with uh, um, measuring uh, gravitational redshift. Okay? So that was a experiment gravitation doing with gravitational redshift. But you you buy yourself a satellite, uh, you put it on orbit. In this uh, uh, orbit, you put a gyroscope. And now each time, well, this is not quite a circular geodesic, but the calculation we would have done would be, which is done in the book is uh, in my notes is at, on a circular geodesic, but you can repeat this calculation on any any geodesic, right? So, so you have this gyroscope, which is kind of pointing in some direction here. And, uh, and when you come back to, where, if you started from here, you've gone through an orbit, then this, uh, the direction will change, right? And there'll be a precession of this axis of rotation. Uh, I think that the precession will be around the, the plane, right? So what, what else could it be, right? So you have a, a plane of uh, where the motion happens, you have a normal vector, and if there's a precession, it can only process around this, this uh, vector here, right? So it's going to change its direction uh, every time you go around, and, and, this is, and this has been confirmed by this experiment, gravity probe B, confirmed in the sense that the, you take these equations, you solve them. Uh, it's a bit of work, not too much in a circular geodesic, a little more on a general geodesic, like one followed by this satellite. Then you calculate, uh, we solve this equation, and you're going to see that there is a precession effect. You measure it, and it's the same as this equation was telling you it's going to be. Uh, what about the lens steering effect? The lens steering effect is, has to do something with, it's again it's this equation. So what you're doing is solving this equation, but you're taking into account that uh, uh, the metric we're going to, you look at in this problem is not going to be the Schwarzschild metric, but it's going to be a metric uh, cause uh, associated with a body which rotates itself. Schwarzschild is spherically symmetric, so if you model the Earth or whatever other object by Schwarzschild, it's going to have, it's not rotating, right? So it, there's no preferred direction. But of course, Earth is rotating. And because Earth is rotating, the metric created by Earth, the gravitational field created by Earth, will not be spherically symmetric anymore. It's going to be axially symmetric, well, to, first up, to the next order of approximation. Uh, with uh, the symmetry being around uh, associated with the axis of rotation of the Earth. Right? So, uh, so, so, so now you solve this equation in a geometry which uh, includes a rotation correction, right? So solve, um, solve one in a geometry where well, there is another term in the metric. Uh, so,
So, so the metric is going to be G is the Schwarzschild one plus, uh, and while actually the plus is a minus, minus epsilon I J K uh, X J. Uh, let me just make sure that I have the signs correct. Yes. So this uh, J here is before J was uh, in our geodesics, J was the angular momentum of the geodesic. Here, J is the angular momentum of the source. Angular momentum. <coughs> so, so we take, still take the same equation. This geodesic procession, we take geodesics in Schwarzschild, we're going to get the first effect. Now we take geodesics, but now in this field, which has this extra rotation, you solve uh, the equation, you get a contribution, right? So a correction to the, uh, to the previous equation. Uh, is called the lens steering effect, right? So LT effect, LT effect. And again, confirmed in this experiment, right? Confirmed by gravity probe B. So just uh, to finish uh, a quick comment on this term. Uh, so, Schwarzschild is Minkowski plus uh, order of one over R. And the correction to Schwarzschild are order one over R. Here, these corrections follow faster. Right? They follow, uh, fall off like one over R3. Because uh, X goes like R, but you have an, uh, like one over R squared, sorry. X goes like R, you have an R3. So the whole thing goes like one over R squared. Therefore, this effect is going to be obviously much smaller and much more difficult to measure. And it was a big challenge to, to measure this in this experiment. And, uh, and I think uh, we're probably more or less done with these gyroscopes. Um, I think There's still one thing that one could mention in this context is a Fermi Walker transport, but uh, maybe I'll do it next week. If not, we'll just uh, start cosmology. Uh, I have to think whether I want just to waste time of Fermi Walker or we just um, go to cosmology. So, any questions on this? None? Good, so uh, then I'll see you next week. And uh, as I said, we're going to start doing uh, cosmology, um, which is a bit of a weird subject for me anyway, but it's promised in the title of the lecture. So it would be embarrassing not to do it at all. So see you next week. See you then, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.